So without further ado, Pete Billington. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I'm Pete Billington, uh, co-founder at Fable. And uh, for the last 20 or so years, I've been helping large teams of people try to bring characters to life. Some of those have been photorealistic or attempts at photorealism in fantastical environments. Others have been highly stylized animations attempting at the illusion of life. But the bulk of them have been the most notorious examples of the uncanny valley that we've uh, ex experienced. So Polar Express, Beowulf, Christmas Carol, and Mars Needs Moms. Um, and when Masahiro Mori actually first coined the term uh, uncanny valley, he was talking about robots. And so you have this spectrum of, like Jessica was explaining, um, you know, maybe a robotic arm to a anthropomorphized robot. But once you get close to a living, healthy person, this phenomenon occurs where things get repulsive. And I found this one online, which is amazing. So uh, this is someone's uh, thesis. But you can see Polar Express and Beowulf are less appealing than a corpse or a prosthetic hand. And hundreds of people worked on these projects. And we were on literally the cutting edge of technology. We were pushing complete boundaries. Um, and it tells me that this is an emotional response. This is not probably a scientific explanation of what's going on. And this is how we rationalize it. As long as you're on the plane of stylization, you're fine. And if you manage to leap this gap and end up at perfect photorealism, you're fine. And we actually saw some stuff that I would argue is pretty close to that today. But you fall in this pit, and everyone falls in this pit for a number of reasons. And I think this is actually what really happens. And this is what I call the chasm of inconsistency. So the suspension of disbelief is the white line moving from left to right. All of these bars are all the components that make up your character. It's hair, it's cloth, the skin tone, maybe it's movement over time. And as fidelity increases, we have this inconsistency that can reveal problems. It can cause us to break our suspension of disbelief. And so what we actually need to do is figure out what the lowest common denominator is. You know, if we can do something really well, but we can't simulate hair, we're going to pick up on that. We're really good at finding the things that break. Um, and if we look at these two still images, which are almost 20 years old now, I would argue that stylization isn't necessarily the answer to inconsistency. It's incredibly hard to maintain stylization across a long project. And the production designer here worked very hard. But actually, this still image of Tom Hanks playing the conductor in Polar Express is more consistent in terms of its lighting quality, the specular highlights. You can see that Marty's eyes here aren't exactly in tune with his fur and the sh shading of his mouth. But when we make things move, it gets even more challenging. So here's some Christmas Carol footage of Scrooge. And there's two types of temporal discontinuity. Local, which is his hair simulation to maybe the poor detail in his mouth. And we can sort of pick up on those inconsistencies. And then more importantly, the ability to sustain that fidelity over time. And I think a lot of these projects get criticized because we have maybe 30 or 40 people working for six months on the hero shot. And then we have 300 other shots that need to hit that same fidelity. And it becomes $300, $400 million to do that in the technological scope that we have. So we spent the last four-ish years now working on bringing Lucy to life. And she was really meant to solve this problem specifically. It's the balance of narrative and interactive. And most of the time when you do that, it always tips in the favor of interactive because interactive is complex and it's very distracting from narrative. I was in Amsterdam last week, and I had the pleasure of seeing this Rembrandt painting. And I realized that many, many, many years ago, he actually solved the problem that we discovered or rediscovered, which is he cast his audience in a role. And in this painting, you play the role of the interrupter. You've interrupted these men who are busy doing something. You've stepped into their moment. And you are now part of the painting. You're part of that narrative. Um, I can only imagine how powerful this would have been when it for, you know, first showed up in the salon to be feeling like you're part of a moment. And we actually approached wolves in a very similar way. We, of course, it took many, many people to bring Lucy to life, but it also really needed to involve the audience. You interact with her. We cast you as her imaginary friend. And therefore, you interact with her. And you bring her to life. So that introduced new forms of inconsistencies, of discontinuities. 
gated choice. So we've all played a video game where the character is waiting for you in a loop, <laughs> right? Pressured choice. Oh my god, what do I do? And then you're paralyzed because you don't want to either kill the character or save them, as we saw with Bandersnatch. Uh, novelty, especially in virtual reality. Everything we do is fascinating. So you could pick up the most mundane object, and it will distract you from the story that's being told. This one is super important. Codependence. We are now going to introduce codependency, codependency with our characters, and they'll become reliant on us if we don't give them a sense of passion, of agency of themselves. And with Lucy, we worked really hard to create illusions where she would just go about her day regardless of the choice you made. So what you're seeing here is a state machine where every choice you make branches the narrative. But we actually call this a braided narrative and not a branching narrative because as you make choices, you might push her off axis, but she'll always return to center. It's her story, it's her agency, it's her passion, it's her soul, right? And this will keep combining and splitting and combining and splitting and it's incredibly labor intensive to sustain this until now, because now we have all of these new tools. We're on the verge of true storytelling superpowers. And it's going to enable us to do some of these things. And most of these things you're already familiar with, but I just want to reiterate them. So characters that are going to spend a lot of time with us, that they're uh, going to learn and grow, that they will share our adventures, and that they can adapt and deliver unique personalized content. Uh, you know, they'll be aware of us, they'll recognize us, and they'll even remember who we are. And then, uh, you know, they may even die one day. So I think this is what a virtual being is, and this is what we're working on now at Fable. Um, but it's going to introduce a whole nother slew of uh, problems with inconsistencies. So we have continuity of identity. What will their memories look like? So will it be perfect? So the potential for this AI to know everything we've ever done, everything we've ever said to it, and remember that in a perfect way, that's going to introduce inconsistencies. What about uh, how we remember things as humans? There's a, a common theory that we only remember our last memory of an event, and that is ever-changing. So do we need to build that into the virtual being? Maya Angelou has this amazing quote, which is, we only remember the way people made us feel. We never remember necessarily what they said or what they did. It's about the emotional payload of the moment. Then we have this idea of continuity of awareness. We have machine uh, learning. We have natural language. So what will it be for a virtual, a virtual being to hear us? What was their intonation, the emotional state Will they under, just understand the subject matter, or will they understand the context of a moment? And what are they going to do with what they hear? Are they going to inform their narrative and change it? Are they going to uh, communicate back to us, adjust their dialect, have consistent language? Will they learn new words? Will we start to share secrets with each other? Now, they're also going to be able to see. So is it going to be consistent with their abilities, or are they going to have superpowers where they can identify the subspecies of a plant and be able to give the Wikipedia entry of that? Or will it be more in line with the character? So as we're introducing these superpowers to these characters, we also have to think about what's going to feel natural to them. And then finally, um, and probably most importantly, we have this idea of continuity of trust. So these relationships are going to require the audience to emotionally commit themselves. Um, and for that to work, the virtual beings are going to have to fulfill a, an emotional need for us. And with wolves, that was to make you feel like a little kid again. We try to put you inside you know, an eight-year-old's mind. And for us to trust each other, it has to be reciprocal. So we have to form bonds together. And so what I'd like to propose to everyone is that we all create something that shouldn't be taken for granted, that it's a two-way street. Um, and that it's not for sure. You know, you need to treat this person as a real friend. Thank you. <laughs>